By what name are you known? There are some who call me... Tim. Welcome to another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And today we are going to look at my third match that I played in the online Dutch old school league, Odal. And for this match, I am playing against Norwegian player Daniel, who's brought a deck to, um, to the table that he's called Zwarte Dauden which means Black Death. It's an Underworld Dreams deck, mono black with artifacts, looking pretty brutal. In the deck deck section, I'll show you the uh, the picture of this deck, and I'm playing against him with my Timmy's Spellbook deck, still my mono blue deck. Now, before we go to the deck deck, as always, I would like to point out that you can also check the description below. There you will find a timestamp marked MTG Games. Click on there and that will take you straight to the games if you want to skip the deck deck. I know that some of you prefer to watch the deck deck after the games or just skip them all together. So you can do that over there. Now here I am going to start with the deck deck and we're first going to look at my deck. Just a quick check, Timmy's Spellbook. Let's take a look. And here we see my deck, Timmy's Spellbook. Now, if you'd like to know more about this deck, like really the specifics have like a proper deck tech, then there's probably a card popping up right now and that will take you back to game number two, uh, uh, no, game number one that I played in this Odal, where I actually give an extensive deck tech on this deck. So I'm not gonna do that now because, you know, you've probably heard me talking about this deck over and over again and it's getting kind of boring, okay? Which I can understand, even though it's a beautiful deck. Of course it is, you know it is, right? Okay, so <laughs> looking at this, um, I'm playing against Underworld Dreams. And obviously I don't know that when I go into a match. You, know, you don't know what deck your opponent is playing. Um, but it's going to be a challenge for me in the sense that I don't have a lot of answers to the Underworld Dreams. I need to counter it or I need to flip my orb on it. That's it. So I need to be very careful with how I use my counter magic and how I use my Chaos Orb. And at the same time, um, it will probably take me some time to see, hey, wait a minute, I'm playing against a mono black deck. I'm playing against an Underworld Dreams deck. Like it takes some time before you have all that information. And I think looking at really the quality players in old school, one of the things that uh, sets them apart from the others is their ability to really quickly assess what deck the opponent is playing and adjust their play to that. I think that's a very important element of uh, old school magic and that's also one of the reasons why I usually like the really creative funky decks because then it's really hard to see what they're actually playing. Okay so these are my 60 and of course 15 cards there in the sideboard. I think those Nevenerals discs are definitely uh, gonna come in after game number one. Uh, let's take a look at the deck of my opponent Daniel. And here we have the deck of my opponent Daniel Swate Dauden and I think Dauden kind of reminds me of Doubt or Dot I should say from the German Death and Swate is black also looks a little bit like the word for black in Dutch Zwart so uh, Black Death that is the name of this deck and what a beautiful deck it is looking pretty brutal here we've got two the Abyss which is going to be super useful against my deck. We've got four Underworld Dreams, and then we also have that Parfait situation going on, which I think works fantastically with Underworld Dreams. For the people that don't know what Parfait is, I've explained a few times on the, ch on the channel, but there are like tons of fits now, so I'll just quick give a quick recap on that. You've got Relic Barrier and you've got Icy Manipulator. What those two artifacts do is they can tap another artifact, right? That's one of the things that they can do. Relic Barrier can do that. Icy gives you some more options, right? So there are two artifacts in a game of old school that you can actually deactivate by tapping them. And those two artifacts are Howling Mine and Winter Orb. So Howling, Howling Mine says, draw an extra card during your draw step, right? So you're going to draw two cards instead of one. Now, this also counts for your opponent. But what you can do when you've got a Relic Barrier or an Icy Manipulator, you can draw your extra card and after that you can tap down your Howling Mine and your Howling Mine is deactivated, right? Untap, upkeep, draw. After your draw step in your main phase or at the end of your turn, whenever, tap down your Howling Mine. Your opponent then doesn't draw the extra card. He only draws one card. Now you can do the same thing with the Winter Orb, but you need to um, tap the Winter Orb at a different moment because you want to have your Winter Orb untapped uh, at the end of your turn so that your opponent only gets to untap with one land. Then at the end of your opponent's turn, you tap down your Winter Orb. Untap, your Winter Orb is tapped, so it doesn't work. So you untap all your lands. So again, you're creating a one-sided Winter Orb and a one-sided Howling Mine with your Relic Barrier and your Icy Manipulator. Now this makes it even extra 
um, useful in this particular deck because what do you want to do with an Underworld Dreams deck is you want to draw into your Underworld Dreams. Your Howling Minds will help you to find your Underworld Dreams. Once your Underworld Dreams is on the table, you want to make sure that your opponent draws a lot of cards. Your Howling Mind will help you to do that. And at the same time, you don't want your opponent to be able to do a lot. So you want to keep his lands down tapped. You can do that with the Winter Orb. An added bonus is that with the IC Manipulator, you can tap down the one single land that your opponent gets to untap. So that is what you call a prison. So there is a soft lock here created with this deck. So if this deck works all the way, it means you probably have an abyss killing all the creatures. You've got a winter orb making sure everything is tapped down with an icy manipulator, tapping down the remaining land that your opponent can tap. And then you also have a howling mind making sure that your opponent is drawing a lot of cards and basically killing himself right so that is pretty brutal what i also like about this deck is that daniel just went for a complete like mono black he didn't go for the red and the black which is something you usually see with underworld dreams um, because of the winds of change and the wheel of fortune he didn't do that he said you know what i'm just going full black and that also gives daniel the access to drain lives you know drain lives obviously become a lot more stronger when you're playing with a lot of swamps now i realize there's only one basic swamp on this deck picture but trust me, he plays with a lot more. I don't know the exact number, actually. So maybe, Daniel, if you want to share it, you can share it in the comments below. And then when we see the sideboard, it's quite interesting. He's playing creatureless mainboard, and he's playing with a ton of dangerous creatures in his sideboard. Look at those cool-looking Jews amps. Now, you've seen my two City in the Bottles that I play mainboard. I'm probably going to board it out after the first game, and then he can board out his uh, board in his Jews amps. So, I mean, that's going to be pretty pretty interesting. Also, Hypnotic Spectre, Dark Ritual combo is possible after sideboarding. So, yeah, this is, this is going to be interesting. I think the one thing that's going to be difficult for Daniel is actually to deal with my artifacts, although he has Relic Barriers as well, so he can just use his Relics to tap down my artifacts, I guess. But my deck is also pretty artifact-heavy, so that could be... That could be something that he can miss in certain situations, like just miss a shadow or disenchant to just get, get rid of an artifact quickly or a crumble. He doesn't have access to that because he's playing mono black. But even, even in that situation, I think the Relic Berry gets even better. Even when you're not playing Parfait, Relic Berry is so useful when you're playing mono black, simply because you don't have a lot of answers to black. So I actually think this deck looks really well constructed, and I'm curious to see how my deck will do actually i think it's a great test so let's just quickly go to game one and uh, and see what's going to happen game number one as you can see i'm sitting on the left side and my opponent daniel is sitting on the right side let's take a look starting with the basic island and ooh, there's a soul ring by daniel that is pretty sweet playing ancestral recall okay that's that's even better very lucky you're finding that ancestral filling up my hand now the question is am i going to discard here or do I have a plan? Soaring on the table, of course, deciding to play. There is a city in a bottle. I don't want to discard. That's why I'm playing the city. Of course, I don't know what kind of deck I am playing against at this time. So I don't know that there's actually no um, Arabian Nights in his deck. So he's not really worried about the city in a bottle, I can imagine. And look at him go here, playing a Relic Barrier and a Sinkhole on my second island, playing out a new island. And now I've got counter capabilities with those two blue untapped. And of course my opponent know th knows that as well. Deciding to go for a sinkhole and I'm going to counter this. And I wonder if he kind of kept an Underworld Dreams in hand there and he's gonna play it out maybe next turn. Finding a Sapphire, okay, there's a Prodigal Sorcerer and I'm giving my opponent here an opening. So this is a pretty big risk I'm taking, but when you have it, Timmy, look at this, here's the Underworld Dreams. I think this is well played by Daniel. I think he purposely uh, played the sinkhole before playing that Underworld Dreams to lure me out of that counter spell and then play that Underworld Dreams after. So I think that's, uh, that's a good decision. We're actually talking about now if he already played a land or not. And I'm telling him that I started the game, so I should be on a land more. So I believe he already had his land drop. And that's always difficult. Sometimes you play so quickly that you forget what you did and what you didn't do. Attacking here with the Tim and untapping it after damage is dealt with the Mace. This is a neat little trick. And now I can still attack and actually ping him for one. So basically my Timmy is now uh, dealing double damage. 
And it's actually looking pretty good for Daniel here. Another Relic Bearer, not super useful yet. Although he can use it to tap down my Sapphire, that can be kind of annoying. Oh no, a second Underworld Dreams. This is a problem for me. That means I'm taking two damage every time I draw a card. I'm just really happy I already played the Ancestral, but oh man. That's another thing that Underworld Dreams really works well against, by the way. Like punishing players like me who play with an Ancestral. Or a Brain Geyser. Wow, a third Underworld Dreams. Oh, man. This is not looking good. Three damage, a Lightning Bolt every time I draw a card. Look at that, going to 14 already. Finding land number four here. And remember, it's really difficult for me to get rid of those enchantments. So I guess I'm just now going on a different strategy. Just trying to play out as many creatures and threats as I can to deal as much damage as I can to Daniel. And this is actually a blocker, so that's quite nice for him. That means that I can no longer attack with my Timmy. Tapping down my Sapphire here, and I'm taking 3 damage, going to 11. I am on a 4 turn clock here, attacking with my Ghost Ship. Taking 2 damage. Deciding not to untap it here, want to keep my Maze open. And, okay, I'm playing an Icy Manipulator, so that will give me the option to tap down the Mishra's Factory next turn and at least be able to swing in with my Timmy again. Very interesting. He is on 12, I'm on 11. I'm getting 3 damage a turn. I'm tapped out, so Daniel can do whatever he wants at this point. And he's activating his Factory. I'm sending it back with the Maze. Dealing a damage, he's going to 11 as well. I'm going to untap, take 3 damage. First asking if he wants to do anything with his Relic Barrier before my draw step. So deciding to use that mana for the Sapphire to activate my IC, tap down the Mishra's Factory probably. And now he's looking at his hand thinking, do I want to do something with that? He doesn't. Drawing the card, going down to 8. Wow, this is so close. I can attack him here for 3, then he'll go down to 8 as well. The question is, do I want to? Just attacking with the ghost ship here. He's going to go down to 9, playing another Timmy. And passing turn. So showing my hand here, four cards in hand. And there's another factory that is not ideal. Pinging him for one, because it looks like he's passing turn here. He's going to drop to 8, but I'm going to drop to 5 here. He's going to tap again my Sapphire in response. I'm going to tap down one of his factories. Not sure if that is the right decision actually to make here. I am attacking with the ghost ship. So he's going to go down to six. Next turn I can then ping him for two. He's going to go down to four. And I should just about make it. And yeah, he's going down to six here. Paying two more. Oh, for a time walk. I think this is the victory, actually. Playing that time walk means that I can ping him, bring him to four, and now take on my extra turn. And go for the victory here. I'm going to draw a card, go to two. And I don't think there's anything he can do at this point. Attacking for two, going to go to two, using my Timmies, and that's it. Wow, what a game one. In all honesty, I thought um, Dan Daniel would, uh, would end up winning this with three Underworld Dreams on the table. That was sick, but I managed to win this one. And uh, I guess we are going to go to our sideboards. I'm going to board out that city in a bottle, not knowing that Daniel here has his Juzam Jins in the sideboard. And I'll probably board in my Nevenero's Discs. So let's, uh, let's skip the sideboarding and continue to game number two. Game number two. Okay, here we go. And I guess it's my opponent Daniel now on the play, which does make a big difference because remember, blue just wants to have two blue open to counter, and that's going to take me an extra turn, unless, of course, I find my Mox Sapphire. But that's just okay. Here it is. That's just a one of. I'm actually tapping it down. Okay, I'm brave. What am I going to play for two? Okay, there is a Chaos Orb. Interesting here. 
And will we see, I thought we were gonna see a single. Now we see a Chaos Orb from Daniel as well. So the question is, am I gonna flip on his Chaos Orb? That is the big question. Playing a copy artifact over my Chaos Orb, flipping on his one. Whoa, let's put it in slow-mo. This hit is extremely important here. Rolling up my sleeves, really taking my time here. If I miss this one, there you see Daniel go. There we see the slow-mo. And bam! Okay, it's a nice, solid hit. And uh, that is very important here. It does mean that I'm tapped out. Chaos Orb gone. And I wonder if Daniel can find one of his sinkholes. Let's see. Oh, he's playing a strip mine. That's just as good. Is he going to strip my strip mine or my island? That's the question. There's something to say for both choices. I guess the island goes because then I no longer have my double blue, which is super important for my deck. Look at that, stripping his. Oh, am I now gonna flip on his remaining land? Really? I guess I am. Okay, <laughs> what a what a weird game number two is. Let's see, I've put this in slow-mo as well. Here we go. And letting it go, bam! Okay, that's another hit. That is good news for me, so that means He's got no lands, and I have a Mox Sapphire left. That's basically it after, how many turns did we play? Three, maybe? There is a Maze of If by Daniel. At least he has some defense. There is a second blue, tapping a blue. Oh, again, finding that Ancestral Recall. That is very unfortunate for Daniel. He had to deal with the Ancestral in um, game number one as well. Finding another card. Let's see what I'm going to do here. Oh, Library of Alexandria. I think I'm going to steal this game now. Ancestral Recall my way into a Library of Alexandria. That's just brutal and really bad luck here for Daniel. There's not much he can do against that. There is my first Timmy hitting the board. And let's see. This is going to be tough. Daniel needs to find... Oh, he's going to discard. I want to say he needs to find land now to kind of get back into this. He's not finding anything though. There's another Mishra's Factory. And remember, I can keep using my Loa to draw extra cards. Playing a Ghost Ship Passing Turn here of seven in hand. Or I think I have seven in hand. There is a Soul Ring. Okay, so I guess Daniel's at least finding some lands. Now he's probably gonna look for a Black Source. So I am untapping everything here. Playing an Island. And what can I do? Well, I can do plenty, actually. I can uh, attack. Or am I going to cast another creature? Attacking just with the ghost ship. He's going to send it back. Then in my second main, I'm going to play... Oh, that's pretty brutal. Going to play an Icy Manipulator. And then the question is, what am I going to tap down? Probably the Soul Ring here. And yeah, deciding to tap down the Soul Ring. For a moment there, I thought I was going for the Mishra's Factory. That would have been a mistake. Going for the Soul Ring instead, really going for the control game. He's finding a Swamp, so maybe he can get back into this. I think first point on the agenda should be getting rid of that Library of Alexandria, but of course he needs a second black to play a Sinkhole. And uh, putting that Timmy button there to indicate that the Paralyze is played on my Protocol Sorcerer, going to draw that extra card again. So much value going on now on my side of the table, deciding not to untap the Timmy. The question is, what am I going to do now with my Manipulator next turn? Probably going to decide. Ooh, copy artifact on the Icy. That is painful. We saw that in the first match I played as well. That can be just such a powerful play. And now I can tap down his Swamp, and I'm probably going to tap down his Soul Ring as well. I'm indicating that now, and he's moving for moving on to his draw step. Another Maze of If. Wow, we could be in for a long game even though I have huge card advantage. Those two Mazes of If are going to be hard for me to play around. Even with the two Icy Manipulators, now I have to make the choice. Am I going to Icy the lands down? Let's see. Tapping four. Casting a clone on the Ghost Ship. Trying to put some more pressure on. Interesting choice here. Tapping down. Am I tapping down now both? Yeah, I'm tapping down the same passing turn. Tapping down his Swamp and his Soul Ring. 
I'm having that two blue open. And look at that. I'm using my Library of Alexandria here just for colorless mana to tap down his lands. And remember, I have so many cards in hand. This is card number eight. I probably have a lot of counter spells in there. And tapping five. Well, we see an air elemental here. Oh, actually deciding not to do that. It is a little bit of a puzzle here when to decide to start tapping down those mazes of if and get a bit more aggressive or how long you're going to um, just tap down his swamp and his soul ring. I guess tapping down those two sources is also working. And look at this. I'm changing my strategy a little bit. Deciding to tap down his swamp and one of the mazes of if so that hopefully I can swing in next turn. Oh, that clone is not a ghost ship. It's actually a Timmy. Okay, that is an interesting choice. And now I've tapped down one of his mazes. Am I going to tap down the next one? I can also attack, of course, with my Mishra's Factories. Deciding not to. I wonder what I have in hand. Sending one back, taking two damage, going down to 15. Again, drawing an extra card from that library. Paying four here, playing another ghost ship, so I'm upping the pressure here. Passing turn. And I'm actually not tapping anything down here. That is an interesting choice. Maybe because I have enough counter spells, I'm not really afraid. But then again, I'm kind of allowing him back in the game here. There's an icy manipulator, probably going to see a counter spell here. And then end of turn, I'm going to try to tap down those two Maze of Ifs. That's exactly what I'm going to do. And I'm going to ping him for one. So he's going to go down to 14. I can make a major swing now. He is on 14. I can deal 10 damage if I activate. Oh, 11 damage. And of course, I can ping as well. So I'm probably going to swing in here. Pretty brutal. I do need a lot of lands, though, to activate them all. So using two lands to activate them, going to swing in here for 10 in total, three ghost ships and two Mishra's factories. So that's a total power of 10 swinging in. And will we see a side blast? Side blast. That's game. That's game. And I think, you know, I think, Daniel, there wasn't much you could do at that point where I played the Ancestral Recall into a library of Alexandria. You're low on lands. You need your double black to play a sinkhole. There's there's really nothing you can you can do at that point. Um, and those are those are power cards for a reason. Uh, you know, uh, it is a very interesting deck though. Uh, to seeing the uh, the black death deck of Daniel, it's really nice. Let's take another look at his brew. Uh, Daniel, I would like to thank you for playing against me in Odo, and I would also like to thank you for watching another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. Now, if you want to support the channel, you can do so very simply, actually, leaving a like, leaving a comment, sharing this on your socials, and subscribe to the channel if you're not a sub yet. All these things are free of charge, and you help me by doing that. So thank you if you've already done that, or if you're going to do that. Um, another thing you can do is you can become a sponsor of the channel, so you can help the channel grow and help me keep making these videos for you. And you can do that by becoming a patron on Patreon. There's probably a card popping up right now. Click on that link and that will take you straight to Timmy Talk's Patreon page. You can already support the channel starting at a dollar a month. Um, talking about patron, let's take a look at the end scroll and let's take a look at all the fantastic, amazing patrons and channel members of Timmy Talks. What shall we do with the drunken sailor? What shall we do with the drunken sailor? What shall we do with the drunken sailor?